I always wanted to speak to the patients in the room for a moment and the people who, who are going to watch this tape because these kind of conferences where you're listening to a bunch of people do, doing science, um, sometimes it's overwhelming that you're getting a lot of information from a lot of different angles. So you've heard about microbiome and you've heard about, you'll be hearing about the metabolomics and you'll be hearing about proteomics and viruses and cells. And I just want to say that this, it's, consider it like making a quilt, you know? It's, it's fleshing out. And five years ago, when I was last year, or four years, whenever I was last year, I would say that quilt was about halfway fleshed out. And today you're seeing advances that are so dramatic that you're really getting into the fine, fine, tight parts of our understanding of all these different systems, enough that they become targetable. So rather than feeling overwhelmed, you should be kind of joyful because it's giving you the kind of... Um, of a science that yields serious and exciting therapeutics. We're right at that translation spot and even stepped over that translation spot um, to the point of therapeutics. So, so I would, even though it may be overwhelming a little bit to hear so much of this stuff, and even what I'm gonna to say today perhaps, um, I would just take it all as, as, as you know, having a, a, a tremendous look at all through all the different windows that are being used to to look at this this illness it's a very exciting time so having said that i'm going to start my talk with a kind of a different flavor I, so i'm going to end with the covid uh, up that the um long covid comparison presentation but i want to start with this one because um when we're trying to see things that when you, when you have an illness that hits a lot of different systems when you have an illness that's in the brain and then you're hearing about neurologic and immune and endocrine, metabolomic, mitochondrial, bioenergetics. Sometimes we're just trying to find things that touch all those systems to try to glom it together, <coughs> or at least things that could be a part of the problem. And so um, I wanted to talk about the role of viruses. And I'm gonna say this from a very, very long view since I've been at this since 1987. And so I've seen it all come and go, and the, the, the idea of the month come up and slide back. And one of those was um, viruses. Viruses was the hot, hot topic pretty early in the game. Um, and I would say that um, the viruses are a hot, hot topic again. So I'm happy to see them back, <laughs> personally. <laughs> because um, targetable points, and we want treatments that um, actually can touch on things that um, we want to you know, find things we can actually fix. So I'm going to say it came back in part because of long COVID. So let me explain that for a moment. But going all the way back to 1990, which is the first paper that I wrote with Dr. Marianne Fletcher, <coughs> who died just this last month and was a true hero to this field, um, the um, first paper we wrote together in 1990 followed um, an observation that we had made in her laboratory after I had a whole series of patients come through my clinic. And the first patient that came in said, every doctor I've seen has told me there's absolutely nothing wrong, but I'm so sick. Would you look at my immune system? So it wasn't my idea to look at her immune system. It was her idea to look at her immune system. I was just, you know, compassionate and we did a lot of immunology stuff. It was the beginning of HIV and we were, you know, had an amazing laboratory, Dr. Fletcher's laboratory that could look at everything. So I said, let's kitchen sink this thing. Let's look every which way from Sunday. And so Marianne did it. She looked at the T cell response, the B cell response, the NK cell response, the immune activation, viruses. And this was what happened with this woman. I, I said, you know what, funny thing, there's something going on here. Your immune system's overactivated. Your NK cells are practically not functional. When I put your cells into culture to stimulate them with things, they, they self-immortalize. There's Epstein-Barr virus in, in your blood that's, that's ca causing these cells to just immortalize. There's something really here. And she burst into tears. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. She says, no, 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 these are happy tears. You're the first person to validate that there's really something wrong and that it's serious. So from that one patient, I got 30. Not because 
who knew me? She knew everybody. She'd been around all these doctors' waiting rooms, talking to people, and she had a whole bunch of people in her little social circle. So boom, I started working up folks. And in 1990, that was in 1987, in 1990 we had enough to write a paper. And we wrote it in the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, which is not one that everybody reads. And um, it got picked up by the AP wire because I had had the audacity to claim that it was some sort of form of an acquired immune deficiency, not, of course, inferring HIV, but as an immunologist, anything you're not born with is acquired. So the language was correct. But it was taken as a um, challenge to the HIV community, and I had hate mail, lots of it. I didn't mind, because it got the whole thing out there. And the, the ME-CFS patients were so excited. And the HIV guys, you know, they had somebody else to hate the next day. They were always mad at somebody. So it was OK. But, um, but that was the story. The beginning of the EBV story for our group was way back then. And then along comes long COVID. And now there are uh, multiple studies that suggest two important things in long COVID. And again, it's very early in the game. And these are relatively, with one exception, small end studies. One is that the, but they seem to be confirming each other. The people who reactivate Epstein-Barr virus during acute infection with COVID are at higher risk for long COVID. They also have more serious acute COVID. So that's one thing. And then the other um, is the long study was done using a VA database. And these are monster databases. They're many, many thousands of patients, <laughs> where they looked at EBV serology and saw EBV reactivation by serology um, in the um, persistently ill patients. So, and now there's papers actually coming out trying to understand the mechanism of that, including this one in the bottom that's looking at T cell exhaustion of specifically the cells that should try to contain Epstein-Barr virus in, in the long COVID, in, in, um, in this case in MS patients, but the same um, group and another group I, I know in uh, doing the same study over again in the long COVID group. So long COVID raises the EBV question again all over. I feel like it's 1990, right? <laughs> and I'm like, oh. Well, that makes sense to me. So let's talk about why it makes sense to me. EBV. There's a lot of things about EBV. First, Epstein-Barr virus is a herpes family virus. There's a bunch of them. They're DNA viruses. They're viruses that um, are incredibly common. HHV6 virus, we hear a lot about in, EB in MECFS, is ubiquitous. Almost everyone's had it by the time they're three years old. And, um, and EBV is like that, too. 95% of adults have had Epstein-Barr virus. Whether you remember your infection or not, because someone could probably redraw your blood and say, oh, it was there. So we all had it. Then you say, well, do we all have it? Well, the answer is yes. We all have latent virus. If it's a herpes family virus, it hangs out. And so EBV is a, a latent virus, hangs out in what we thought was predominantly our B cells, but it's also in your parotid, your, your salivary glands, and a lot of um, epithelial cells, particularly in the mouth and the throat. And so it's got two different places it hangs out. And it sits there being quiet. Well, the immune system is, if you've got a cell that's got a virus in it, and it's the cell that would otherwise be coding for your immune response to something you're never going to see, like Lassa fever, right? Well, that EBV is never going to come out of that virus. It's never going to be activated. It's never going to see its antigen. It's never going to get going. So there's, it can hide out, quietly hiding out. And you have a lot of immune surveillance trying to keep it from coming out. But then it gets turned on if you hit the cells that are, um, that are infected, or that are latently infected. and then. Any cell that's uh, turned on makes the stuff it knows how to make, and it knows how to make this virus, so it starts chucking out the virus, along with the antibody it's supposed to code for. So that's what's going on when you reactivate a, a, a virus from a, a latent infection. You have to have some bad luck that you also hit the infected cells with the antigens they had to see. Well, bad luck is not that uncommon, because there are lots of viruses that turn on very noisy viruses that turn on in a very broad way, sweeping immune responses called polyclonal activators. And they're, they're mostly herpes family viruses. And they are, um, they can come out and then just sort of turn on the background noise of your immune system. And then 
these viruses try to creep out and your immune system has to come slam it back down again. And, and every day that's going on. And all of us, we're all trying to reactivate viruses and our immune system's trying to keep that from happening. Um, <clears throat> but those immune exhaustion papers, like I just mentioned, would say that it's possible to exhaust your immune's capacity to do that effectively, that you can wear it out, basically use up all the stuff it's using to try to keep viruses in contained. So that's underneath it all, what's going on. In this COVID theory here on this slide, it's saying um, that it, if EBV is engaged, it's more likely to have neurocognitive, neurocognitive sequela, more like NECFS, if you would. So they're saying perhaps it's the EBV that triggers the neurocognitive um, sequela in this. So this is what I was just saying. There's it, the virus you start with, this lytic virus makes a ton of virus at your acute infection, millions and millions of virions kicking around, infecting you and giving you mononucleosis. But then when it gets quiet, it's far less. One would suggest about a million cells in your body infected instead of many, many hundreds of millions. And, um, and if they sit around quietly, you're going to be okay. But if they slowly leak uh, virus out, then you're reactivating and you're stirring up an immune response. And while I'm focused on EBV, this is also true of HHV6, the other virus we talk a lot about in, um, in MECFS. So there's another weird thing that is a neat focus of research, and I love this group. We've sent them a ton of samples to help them with their, their work. Because they're saying, when a virus has been latent and you activate this cell, typically in science, you have to fulfill Cox postulates. The cell has to make a whole virus, a virus that's able to go infect another cell, and that that's how it does its dirty deed. That's how it becomes pathogenic. These people are saying, that's not true. If a virus has its stuff in your, in your cellular engine, in, your, in the cellular um, programming, and you kick that cell on, it's going to make virus stuff, not whole virus necessarily, but it can make the enzymes the virus uses, the, the bits and pieces of the cell wall, and all the things that need to assemble into a whole virus. But if that assembly is incomplete, you might not ever make a virus, but you could still be making enough enzymes, specifically this DUPTase enzyme that's Epstein-Barr virus's own specific enzyme, um, that has a huge biologic effect in people, that the enzyme itself coded by viral uh, DNA, um, but in a human cell, is being produced. And that alone is enough to cause a whole lot of, of symptoms. And these guys have a solid 15 years of work on this. Um, it keeps getting better and better. Not my work, it's just my cells. The cells, not my cells, your cells. Your cells that I kept in my freezer. <laughs> but anyway, I shared your cells with uh, Dr. Dr. Williams and Dr. Ariza. And this work was started, again, by um, a very beloved EBV uh, virologist, Dr. Glazer, who's no longer with us. But um, I want to make sure he gets credit for, for starting this ball down the, the path. So um, this is their sort of mechanisms of how that would work. And I know in a patient conference, you love all these arrows and things. So I'm going to do this. Hello. <laughs> so. Um, the other question about EBV reactivating or other herpes viruses is that they're in the B cells, they're circulating around. You can see how they can make your body feel bad. Um, but they're also in your, and they're in your epithelial cells, so you can see where perhaps they could give head and neck symptoms and that type of thing, perhaps. Um, but how do they get into your brain? And so there's a, a, a nice um, paper by um, uh, colleague that's here at this conference, Dr. Gottschalk, Dr. Gottschalk and Dan Peterson. And uh, Dan, uh, you all know very well, and uh, Gunnar was Dan's student a long, long time ago. Now he's a faculty member and smart guy doing really amazing science. But he put this paper out just uh, this year, just a couple months ago, that uh, proposed that there were ways that the, the um, immune effect of this virus and the peptides from this virus could actually be getting into the central nervous system and stirring up a lot of neuroinflammation. So that was um, an important point because we know this is a brain disease. Now there's one other thing that matters about viruses is when, how do you tie this 
back to um, another really key feature of MECFS, which is energy, or bioenergetics, which ultimately means the mitochondria, your energy factory. And there is a way to do that, that, that the uh, virus, CBV, and in this case, um, uh, um, long COVID, because uh, uh, the SARS-2 virus, um, actually have an interface uh, with the membrane of the, um, oops, I thought I had that slide, a membrane of the uh, mitochondria. And it's important enough to, um, to interfere with the usual mitochondrial function. So when the virus is binding to the actual mitochondria uh, membrane, it's affecting what's going on inside that mitochondria and it's downregulating it. And more importantly, that mitochondria is supposed to be doing really important things to um, keep the uh, virus from being able to replicate and it's shutting those mechanisms off. So it has a way of making itself stay, this is you know, Darwin from the virus's point of view, is the evolution of a virus that made it shut off the normal uh, mechanisms that would have contained it. So um, that, that's really important. It's, it's a lot of work going on because EBV is one of the viruses that can cause specific cancers and there's been a lot of work about how the virus managed to evade the immune system and do that. And it's work that's important to our field, the, the MECFS field. So I wanted to just spend that moment taking in the big picture then that, that we're talking about viruses again. I don't think the clinicians ever stopped talking about viruses, but I know the researchers sort of gave it a lull there for a while. <laughs> so this is great because it's going to encourage people to, to take it back into the big picture and where, where do... Uh, viruses fit in the evolution of this illness and the persistence of this illness. And what does it matter to someone who's been ill a year or two versus someone who's been ill, say, 10 or 20 years? Where does, the, where does, where does it fit in the duration of illness argument? Um, I didn't want to just move on without giving some credit to the fact that there's a whole lot more viruses than herpes family viruses in the world. We talk a lot about herpes family viruses because um, that's where we looked, you know. We, we know what you've seen. Uh, and then John Chia's work um, looking at enteroviruses in the gut brings up the whole question about the gut as a reservoir of virus, the virome of the gut. You hear a lot about the bacterial um, makeup of the gut or the fungal makeup of the microbiome of the gut, but you don't hear a lot about the virome of the gut because it's kind of a new and hot area. But John Chi has done these studies where he took biopsies from people who were having endoscopy for other reasons and um, looked for EBV, CMV, and enteroviruses and found enteroviruses most commonly and in a far higher percent in MECFS than in people that had gone for scoping just for, um, for reflux or some other non-MECFS reason. So if you look at MECFS patients who go to um, get an endoscopy, there's about an 80% chance that he could pick up in um, the, the tissue biopsy evidence of enterovirus, and it was around 40 or 50% for EBV, and I think it was around 30 or 20 for CMV. So there's viruses reactivating in the gut, and it's a compartment we can't see if it doesn't circulate in the blood. In this particular case, the antivirus doesn't circulate in the blood, so we miss it. We have to go for a scope to be able to find it. So um, when you see uh, these stories, I'd like to make sure that we're including the fact that there's an immune system that's broken enough to let viruses out, is broken enough to let any latent virus out, and uh, we shouldn't be so one virus, and I just did a whole EUV talk, there's not one, that one virus uh, kind of way of thinking here. So when you're thinking about ways to put that back together again, you're either repairing the immune system in a way that it's effective again in some, some, some way, or you're using antivirals that are effective against broad spectrums of virus or more than one antiviral. So there's different ways to think therapeutically as you're going forward uh, trying to contain these viruses wh who can, which can drive a great deal of um, the types of, of things we see biologically in, in our patients. So it's really, really complicated. 
And what's neat, and you're hearing some of this today, is that one of the huge advances in medicine is the ability to deal with really, really complicated. The early work of Ron in the, in the genomics project gave us these vast amounts of data in the billions when before we were dealing in, in hundreds, and then all of a sudden we had this huge amount of data. It's only grown since then so that we can the, 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 after they successfully mapped the whole human genome, we're standing in a place that did one third of that work, which is amazing. At least that's what it said in the card. Is that true? You would, you'd be able to tell me. But the, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I think that uh, th that made us deal with big data and deal with it in a way that can be pretty amazingly um, approached through something called computational biology or systems biology, where these mathematicians and these physicists and these engineers get this tremendous amount of data and say, that's not enough, I need more. And that's what happened to our group. So we started, we were one of the first groups, I think, to, to take the exercise challenge approach to understanding MECFS. Um, and we're certainly the first one to use systems biology or computational biology methods to, to deal with that data to try to model what's going on in this illness at a complexity level where you could have the audacity to say that you could propose through computer modeling what the treatment should be and then do in silico trials, meaning in the computer, and have a computer run hundreds of thousands of trials for you, millions of trials for you, and, and then bring back to you the things that look the most promising. So we've been using that approach now for about eight or nine years. It's pretty exciting stuff. And we've been um, and moving it along. So I asked um, that group and, our, and for this talk, actually, to have a um, systems biology approach to what do you do for viruses. So um, this is this amazing team. Where I didn't mention it, Nova Southeastern, where we all settled there about 10 or 11 years ago from a whole bunch of different institutions to tackle MECFS with 18 faculty members and a total of 50 or 60 people that are working on this long COVID and military toxic injuries. That's our whole portfolio. That's what we do all the time. And um, they're very similar. So there's a lot of reason why we picked those three, three um, spaces to work in. But the computational team is amazing. And, um, and when I said that the antivirals we use in clinic just don't, don't sustain wellness. They can get some, some improvement for a while, but then they tend, people tend to relapse. They took that as a challenge. So um, they went through the literature. And one of the studies that we discussed was the rituximab study, the Norwegian rituximab study. We were all very excited about the study, not because it was um, the autoimmune hypothesis, but because B cell is an enormous reservoir of Epstein Barr virus. And we thought if you took out the B cells, you might actually take out a big chunk of the EBV, perhaps bringing it below the threshold that the immune system could then handle. If you could get enough of it down, then maybe the immune system could pick it up from there. So um, they took on that challenge and they have made some proposals. So they were, this is um, Travis Craddock's slides that I'm showing now. But he was saying that perhaps um, just using rituximab wasn't going to be enough because there's this other reservoir, the epithelial cells, that are hanging on and they just reseed the immune system and restart the, the um, vicious cycle of, of reactivation. So taking that on is his challenge. He started building a computational model that took on all the different cell types that um, are engaged and perhaps even some of the other viruses that are, are similar and, and we're building this model. Um, it's very simple right now, but it's going to improve in its complexity as we gather more data. So one of the things we noticed, and it's very early to say this, is um, because this is a, a very early study, but I was here about five years ago talking about the 23andMe study, and a lot of people volunteer here and else all around the, the world and sent us their data, their 23andMe data, and we dug through all that data and we found this little clue, I hope it holds up, because in genomics you need ends of like 20 or 30,000 to say something really meaningful, and, and this was an end of under 5,000. I think we have 5,000 people in and about 3,500 data sets that we could look at really well. But we saw this one gene that codes for mucin, which is the mucusy stuff up your nose and in, in your bladder and in your throat and all over the place protecting you from, from bugs. 
It's your, you have a, a layer of skin, if you would, and you have a layer of immunoglobulin, IgA. If you're lucky, you've got IgA. Some people don't. And then um, you got mucus on top of that. And then the bug has to get all the way through that, right, to get to infect the tissue. So one of the thoughts might be that MECFS patients might have defective mucin, which might have a reason why they were at risk to begin with. So he's putting that into the model. We'll see if it's if it fit models, but we're also trying to do the bigger study that would hopefully prove or disprove that whole hypothesis. And um, we're tackling um, the hypotheses of how to best model intervention um, and whether or not um, this, this mucin is a part of our, our big picture. So the initial modeling um, is all math, you know, it's, it's not really biology, but it's math. Math becomes biology, which is pretty cool. I, I can't explain this the way he does it. <laughs> Just excuse me for that. But it starts out with a diagram of the system. And then they start modeling what would happen if you just treated with rituximab. And the answer is you'll get an initial response and it'll bounce right back. What would happen if you just treated with an effective antiviral? You work and then it'll bounce right back. So what happens if you start repeating treatments or doing them in orders? So when here you're asking the computer, to find the timing, the combinations, and the order. And that's, he's starting to see data and it says, well, initially, actually, it didn't work all that well um, because, again, if it didn't work on the epithelial cells, if you just did rituximab alone, for instance, it's never gonna work because you got this reservoir in the, hiding behind it that's gonna reseed everything. If you just use antivirals, um, you'll suppress the virus for a while, but eventually, um, if you stop it after six months, you're going to see rebound. So he proposed through this computer modeling that you do basically both, that you're, you're hitting with rituximab and with the antivirals in a specific order of go over repeated, repeated, repeated goes. So it's just interesting because this is a computer that's suggesting it. And if you talk to any rheumatologist, they'd say, well, that's sort of the way we use rituximab. Certainly the MS doctors, that's the way we use rituximab. We, we use it on a cycle. We don't expect it to, to do such a long and sustained thing, but, um, but they certainly don't necessarily use it in combination with other strategies. So in this strategy, he gets a um, um, long-term sustained um, a viral suppression. So that's just the beginning of a, what is gonna be a far more complicated model because there's a whole lot more variables to work into it, like the entire immune system. It's a small thing to leave, has to be dealt with. <laughs> but it's a very exciting thing to be using this, and I was, another hope building moment. We had the same kind of model that we have for MECFS, where we used the dynamic modeling and figured out the whole complexities of homeostasis across neuroendocrine, immune, um, brain, you, know, you name it, we measured it. We measured it nine times in a row, eight in the first 24 hours, and, and once more at, 20, at, at um, 24 hours with all the clinical parameters and the, I gave it to those guys and they created this amazing model and they ran their in silico trials and predicted for Gulf War illness, uh, a specific intervention and is a, an illness we have a great animal model for. So the very first thing they predicted for us, which was that nothing would ever work by itself, that you needed to use a combination, you had to hit two systems, at least, at least multiple systems that are homostatically balanced and you had to do it in the right time course. Anyway, in the animal model, the very first set of animals that we treated with the proposed therapy at our best guess dosing um, actually worked. It was like we were doing the happy dance and these animals were um, the equivalent of 10 years sick and sustained their wellness for the rest of their normal lifespan from a single round of the treatment. So that was our Gulf War thing, which is a lot like MECFS, the animals, uh, what's going on is very, very similar because that's a neurotoxic hit just once, and then um, some other things happen, and then they have sustained neuroinflammation for the rest of their lives. So we're able to, to fix the animal model, and now we're doing the human study. We translated that to human already in Gulf War. We've done our first phase one, it's complete, and we're doing our second phase one, which is like a dose tweak, and it looks like you know we're, we're on it. It looks pretty good. The first one, we almost got there. We're real close, better than we predicted. And the second one, we're, we've got our fingers crossed, but we're, we're optimistic. 
So we have the exact same data in ME-CFS uh, that we had in Gulf War, and we've been ready to do our clinical trial for five years. We just haven't been able to. Well, I found a nice donor to start, get us started, and then a pandemic happened, and I, wasn't, I had to stop all the research for several years. So um, one of our drugs is immunosuppressant. We weren't allowed to use it at all during the pandemic. So, um, so where we are with ME-CFS in this now is that donor money is still sitting in that fund, and we got the protocol through the IRB, and we're anticipating a start date in mid to late summer, which is very exciting. And if we get some preliminary data that we can flip into an R01 or some sort of NIH thing, then we'll, we'll be following that up. So that's good news. Pandemic wasn't such good news, but this was good news. At least we, we get to move it. So uh, I think com computational modeling is like a really cool tool for such a complex illness and that it's very practical and it moves us to treatments years and years and years faster than it would have otherwise uh, been available to us to use. So our next steps is to keep on moving down this path. Uh, we're gonna improve our antiviral modeling and layer it into our other model and try to pull all that together into, um, you know, I call this our moonshot because these are our curative, um, curative, hopeful, curative, not just symptom management types of studies. They're, they're big gun studies that we're, we're trying to, to move to. So that's exciting. So that's it. Thank you very much. My long COVID slides were out of there. Yeah, I had two more slides. So I'm going to say real quick. We're doing, because I had them, I don't know where they went, but the uh, long COVID is a, um, a study. We're, we're doing a CDC study, meaning it's funded by the Centers for Disease Control, comparing MECFS to long COVID. The hard thing to do with MECFS and long COVID right now is um, pick up new patients with MECFS that happened in the last three years because we don't know if they're post COVID or not, right? So they really have to rely on these older data sets. It just happens that we have this great MECFS data set at the CDC with 750 patients that had a really good phenotyping study done um, right before the pandemic. So we have this great comparator group in, you know, in the data set. So we're basically repeating that study with some tweaks because smell, taste, things that weren't in that study, but uh, echoes, <laughs> lung, lung assessments that the, uh, we're doing a phenotyping study in the long COVID group to compare. And that's the South Florida study. If you have any friends in South Florida with long COVID, we are recruiting and we're having trouble finding everybody. We know they're out there, but they're hiding in their living rooms, not turning on the, not reading their email. <laughs> so uh, so uh, help us recruit. But uh, it's an exciting study and, uh, and it's gonna, be uh, data that we can share. It'll be in the big public repository of data, so that'll be great. And um, of course, samples that we will be sharing, so that'll be great. So pretty good without a slide. I'll sort of remember. Okay, I think we've got time for one question. Otherwise, if anybody else has more questions, they can catch Nancy at one of the breaks. Down on the left. Sorry, I don't know if I missed it. Really fascinating. Um, what was the treatment that you used in the Gulf War animal model trial? So the animal model, we had to reduce neuroinflammation mm -hmm. first by, by, by half. This is another real important thing in modeling is that um, the engineers tend to turn things on and off rather than pull them down. And the body works on rheostats. We don't ever turn things all the way on or all the way off. So that took a little tweaking to get the model to the point that we weren't just shutting things off. Anyway, we're using for that part etanercept, um, which is a monoclonal that's a TNF uh, receptor antagonist. And then um, the, that had to be used first in the animal model. And then in the, hum the next step after you've quieted the brain down for a long enough time that the brain environment is starting to, you would think, hypothetically, start, start being more able to hear this normal, subtle signaling that's going on in the brain. The inflammation's interfering with, say, the HPA access because of, of um, sort of a noisy brain, if I were to characterize it as a background noise. So when you quiet that down and the signaling starts being uh, more appropriately managed, then we block the adrenal gland um, signaling 
using a drug that uh, is a glucocorticoid receptor antagonist, a very controversial drug in our country, in my state, um, mifepristone, because it's also used for abortion. Um, but anyway, it's a wonderful glucocorticoid receptor antagonist with 20 years of safety data. And I won't even get on that one because this is a crazy time in the United States. But the, um, that'll shut off the ability of the adrenal gland to hear the request for more um, um, cortisone. So now the adrenal gland's going, hey, I need cortisone, and it starts sending them through the feedback loop, screaming loud noises more and more and more and more. So we block it for a week, not a long time, and then um, remove it. It's sort of like taking the, the blocks off a, a, a race engine, a racing car, and having it peel out, right? So we're asking the adrenal gland to peel out and start making its cortisone correctly in response to normal signaling. And that essentially reboots the whole HPA axis regulation that is uh, regulating cortisol. Now cortisol is one of your most important anti-inflammatories your body makes. So having that work appropriately, quickly, fine tuning it, making sure it's not overworking, underworking, it turns out to be a rather important homeostatic loop in, in chronic inflammatory illness. So, so that's the idea in the animal. Um, in the human ME-CFS model, um, we actually have to touch a third button. In the men, it's going to be testosterone. And in the women, it's going to be estrogen, depending on the age of the woman and the guy's testosterone states. So they have to be deficient to want to fix it. So um, we're sub, sub, subgrouping, but it's exciting. It's, it's how it's going to work is defining these subgroups and and really refining it. So we'll find out. You know, you're gonna you're gonna hear more. Invite me back. <laughs> I think that's very likely, Nancy. Okay, thank you. Um, so we should move on. Thank you again, Nancy. Thank you very much. Thank you.